My name is Jared Vandevoort. I am the creative director and one of the partners at a digital agency based in New York called Hyped. And today I'm going to be sharing a bit of my workflow and process and tips behind creative product lighting techniques. And a lot of this is within the context of working with clients. Sometimes they'll send over a CAD file, or if you're lucky, an FBX, and they'll say, hey, do the thing. And they won't really tell you what, right? And one of the best ways that we can really elevate and storytell with product design is using lighting. So today I'm going to share a little bit of behind the scenes. It's going to be very pragmatic, and I hope that everyone here can take a little bit of, a little bit of wisdom away from you know, how to approach better lighting. So a little bit about me. I'm actually uh, a programmer. I studied computer science at NYU Shanghai and uh, actually did a lot of machine learning. Um, and then I, I realized that I had this creative bug in me, right? I always needed to create something. So uh, I started learning Cinema 4D probably about two years ago. Uh, it's been a hell of a ride. Um, but what's nice is you're going to get a really unique perspective on lighting, right? There are so many incredible and talented people that have come up here with video and photo backgrounds, and they'll have a very technical understanding of lighting. So this is going to be a little bit of a unique approach from a coder, which is going to be really interesting. Um, you should also know that I love shoes. It's what I started doing my renders with, and they're such a fantastic canvas for creative exploration. Right? You could imagine having a Nike shoe, which requires a lot of motion. Or maybe you need a Balenciaga type shoe, where you need the energy to be a bit more esoteric and mysterious. So lighting plays such a crucial role in creating that energy, which is why it's so important. And then I also love pizza. I'm from New York. That's where I live currently. Uh, and this is actually an image of date night with my computer. This is my, uh, my usual Friday night. That's what it looks like. Um, so it's just, just off to the side there. You can't really see it. <clears throat> and the other thing that you should know is that I love learning and I love teaching. It's something that I learned very quickly in university was that the best way to crystallize learning anything was to turn around and teach it. So that's what I did. I started posting tutorials online about my process and basically absorbed what felt like 2,000 Cinema 4D tutorials and turned them into reels. And I didn't really think anyone would care, but very quickly I grew to over 50,000 followers in less than a month. So shameless plug, if you're looking for some tutorials, some knowledge, uh, my, my Instagram is jared with two r's, dot exr, you can check me out there. <clears throat> and you might be wondering why lighting, right? Like, look, Jared, I just flew all the way to Las Vegas, and I'm at this 3D booth, and we could do all kinds of cool stuff. We could do animation, we could do pyro, and you're going to talk to me about lighting. Why? Well, the important thing, and this is something that I learned very early on, is that with lighting, it is the one key recipe, or sorry, it's the one key ingredient in every good render that you see. Anything that you see online where you're just like, wow, that's so incredible, always has good lighting. So having a really good foundation and understanding of lighting is so important, and it's something that I learned very, very quickly on. And uh, I mean, to further prove this point, this is actually where I started. This was one of my first renders, and I basically got my hands on a cool Nike shoe, and I was genuinely so proud of this. I, even, I think I even made my mom put it on her fridge. <clears throat> but what you'll quickly see is that even with a little bit of an approach to lighting, and we'll get more into the details, we can really elevate the quality of our renders and create that really premium feel. So here's just a side-by-side -side of mom's fridge and what you might see in a Nike commercial. And today we're going to do this. I'm going to show you a really approachable way to get your lighting right. We're going to go through a few different systems. And then we're going to get really creative with it. So one important thing is we kind of need to agree on what makes good lighting, right? There are lots of very technical approaches to lighting. You know, production teams will have hundreds of people on set to make sure the lighting is perfect. And that's one of the most beautiful advantages about 3D is that we have total control over the lighting, right? We can position lights in space. We can change the color. We can change the intensity. And it's, it's so much more efficient, in my opinion, to hiring a production team, making sure you get it all right in one day. That's a, that's a lot of pressure. So my definition of good lighting is lighting that creates a lot of contrast, right? It's separation from subjects in the scene, 
It's a separation from the background. And contrast also pulls focus and pushes focus. So you can imagine for someone like Nike, a lot of the energy we want to be spent on the logo, we, right? We want to be bringing focus to different attributes of the shoe. You could imagine if, let's say, the focus for this campaign was the, the cushy heel, right? We want to use contrast to bring energy to that aspect of the shoe. The second aspect of good lighting is generating depth and creating depth in an intentional way. You know, a lot of the approach here is how do you create those really beautiful renders, those scroll-stopping renders, bringing these products to life? And depth is such a crucial part of that, right? We can, we can deploy techniques like background blur and, and bokeh, and, and we'll look at that as we go through here. And then the third approach, or at least the third aspect of good lighting, is interest, right? Every render that you want to come across or everything that you want to put out has to feel interesting, it has to feel new, it has to feel fresh. And especially now in the digital age that we live in, you are swimming in a sea of content. So how do we create interest in our lighting? So today we're going to be looking at the foundation for any good lighting setup, which is three-point lighting. This is used in studio productions, um, and it's a very popular lighting technique. And what it does is it gives us such a fantastic foundation for lighting that gives us a lot of art direction and control. So, the three-pointing lighting setup consists of a key light. This is the main light source that's going to be bringing energy into our scene and lighting our subject. We're going to have a fill light. This is going to highlight any shadows that feel underexposed. And then we're going to have a backlight. And the backlight is going to silhouette our subject and create separation between the background. So these are kind of our three main ingredients that we're going to play with today. And we're going to look at different ways that we can use these to create really interesting lighting techniques. And just to further drive th that point, these were three renders that I did uh, over the past year. And each one of these is actually using the exact same lighting setup. So what you see here is that no matter the geometry, the shape, the textures, you get really impressive results with just three lights. And that's really powerful. I think anyone that has worked in 3D knows how hard getting lighting is. And sometimes it's really hard to find a good place to start. So today, this is what we're, going to, what, we're, what we're going to be creating. We're going to have three different approaches, all using this three-point lighting system. And with each approach, we're going to explore different ways to modify that three-point lighting system to create these really cool renders. And you can imagine, you know, with the different client briefs that you get or the different projects that come your way, each project has a different type of energy, right? And being intentional about that energy will lead you to better results. So we're going to be a bit intentional today. We're going to create some really different, cool uh, lighting setups. And uh, my hope is that you can take some of this and apply it to your own workflow. And then as we go through here, I'm also going to sprinkle in some workflow tips uh, so that you can get faster with your lighting process. Cool. So now we're going to jump right into Cinema 4D, <clears throat> into the beginning scenes. And this is where any good project starts, right? A client will send over some models. They'll say, hey. Let's make it look good and not really give you much more than that. Sometimes we'll have a team giving you direction, but today we're just going to kind of go with it and see what we cook up. <clears throat> so before we get into setting up our three-point lighting setup, it's important to di distinguish that there are two different approaches to lighting within the context of 3D. There's something called image-based lighting, which is when you capture something called an HDRI. And what an HDRI is, is a, 3D rep or it's a 2D representation of a 3D space and all the light data that comes with it. And HDRs are very popular because you can just kind of throw them in and you'll have a lighting setup out of the box. But one of the challenges with image-based lighting is that it's really difficult to get full control. And what's so important with product lighting is that it's so important to have that control so you can accentuate key aspects of your, of your product. So today is going to be the other type of lighting, which is point source lighting. And we're going to focus on how do we bring in this three-point lighting setup and use it and have full control to create these different setups. So getting right in here, we're going to add a few area lights. Let me just grab a little bit of water. <clears throat> cool. All right. <clears throat> so if we go into our Redshift menu, this is where we have access to all kinds of objects that we can use to light our scene. And if we go to light, we have a whole bunch of lights. 
And one of the hardest part about getting started with Cinema 4D is which light should I use, right? So today we're going to be focused primarily on the area light. And the area light is unique in that it gives us a physical object in space that we can maneuver around our scene. So if we bring in an area light here, I'm just going to go in top view. And then we're going to move this back. We can start to see this area light start to light our shoes. And you're probably thinking, wow, those are some really white shoes. Yeah, it's because our light is overexposed. So what's nice about Cinema 4D and what's nice about Redshift is that we have a lot of control over the individual aspects of our light. So here under the Attributes panel in the bottom right, there's a whole bunch of attributes associated with the light. Intensity and exposure are both measures of strength and power of the light. So you can see as we decrease the strength here, we're going to lose light. And if we increase the strength here, we're going to get an overexposed look. But we can use this to kind of tweak our, our lighting setup. So for now, I'm going to just drop this to negative 3. And then with color, we can also pump in different colors, which is always very fun, especially creating unique looks. So we can pump in all kinds of different colors here. You know, let's say we're doing a, a brand collab with the Patriots. Maybe we need a little bit of blue. But for now, we'll just stick to white. And then under the Shape tab, we can adjust how large and how wide and how narrow our light is. And at first, I didn't really understand how important this was. And the reason why is that different size lights create different uh, harshnesses of shadows. So a really large light creates really soft shadows. And a really small light creates really harsh shadows. And we know this because the sun is actually the biggest light in our universe. And it's the reason why during golden hour, everything looks beautiful. You get basked in this, you know, these rays of, of soft light. So today, we're going to be looking at how we can adjust the, the light size to really create different looks. And then the last measure we have here is spread. And what spread does is adjust how focused our light is. So if our, if our spread is low, our light's going to get more focused. It's almost to, let's see here, and show you guys really quick. So if I go to point 0.1, and then we decrease the size of our light, you'll see it's very, very focused. And if I increase the spread, our light's going to be more diffuse. And we're going to use this to create that luxury look in the second scene. So now that we have our first light set up, we're going to set up the three-point lighting setup. I'm going to take this first light, and we're going to call this our key light. Key light. And then let's increase the size to something like 100 by 400. And we're going to move this off to the right. And as I'm moving this, you're noticing that the light is not focusing on our object. So how do we do that, right? We want, we're not going to want to move and maneuver and rotate our light every time we add a new one. So in Cinema 4D, we have this really nifty tag called the target tag. And what the target tag does is tell our light which object to focus on. And there's actually a really nifty little shortcut. So if you go into your light, there's a little drop down here where you can say, add target tag and null. And now this adds a null to our scene. And that is just a, a point in space that we can point our light towards. So now you can see as I move this, we have total control over where our lights are pointing, which is really powerful. So if we're doing an animation, our, our, our lights can follow our shoe, and we like that. Cool. So now that we have our key light set up, actually, I'm going I'm to toggle some, uh, some materials here to make this a little more interesting and fun to look at. Cool. Let's bring in our regular. <clears throat> so I'm going to just move this key light around. And you can see how dramatic the position of our light can really change the look of our scene. This is why this is so important, right? So if we position it you know, directly on, our, our shoe's going to feel flat. If we move this and put this in an angle that is maybe behind the shoe, we're going to get some really interesting shows created. And this is where we go back to you know, what makes good lighting, right? It's good contrast. It's interest. So now that we have this key light, <clears throat> we're going to bring in some other lights. Um, let's add in our backlight. I'm going to call this backlight. We're going to move this off to the left side. Well, bam. And now we're capturing the edge of our shoe and really creating this really nice silhouette. And this is also following that three-point setting, or this three-point lighting setup that I showed up in the beginning. So one of the beautiful things about Cinema 4D is we can also toggle lights 
and really understand how they're contributing to the scene. And we do that by clicking this check mark. So I can, I can just focus our backlight for this one. And now we can move this and position this in a way that illuminates our subject just how we like it. So now I can toggle our key on here. Cool. And then for the final light, we're going to add a fill light. And this is just going to fill in some of the shadows and some of the dark areas. Let me just add this. And then we're going to move this right here just to fill in some of that heel area. Um, and maybe the exposure is a little too much. Let's go like negative five. Cool. So already we're getting this, these really nice results just with a few lights here. <clears throat> And then we're, we also need to obviously have a background. So let's get into background. And this is actually one of my favorite Cinema 4D tips and tricks, is you can actually have uh, a separate light on your background that then you can use to really control the lighting on your background. So I'm going to move this back here. And let's just add our background. I'm going to add a plane and just make that 2,000 by 2,000. And maybe we can move this up just a wee bit. Cool. So one of the things you're noticing now is that our lights are affecting our background, which is not necessarily something that, th that we want, right? We want full control over what our background looks like. So there's something called light linking, which allows us to prevent certain lights from affecting other objects. So what we can do in our fill light is say, hey, let's go to the project tab. And here under mode, we can say exclude. And we want to exclude our background. And we're going to do that for each light here. And then let's go to our key light, and we're going to say exclude our plane. And now you'll notice that our backlight is no longer lit. So let's bring in a light to light our background. Let's go to lights, area light. Let's bring in one more. And then we're going to add a target tag and null again and put that in our background. <clears throat> and then I'm going to move this background light down just to create this kind of gradient effect. And let's drop our, our exposure, just because it feels a little overexposed. Go a little higher. And maybe we increase the size to get a little softer shadow. Cool. Wow, cool. So now you can see, with only just a few lights, we can create a really interesting lighting setup, right? We just have three lights, maybe a background light. One of the things that we'll notice, let me just disable the first three lights. Our background light is actually affecting. You can just see our background light is the only one enabled right now. It is affecting the lighting on our shoe. So let's change that, because we only want it to affect the background. <clears throat> cool. So let's bring in these lights. Sorry, I actually added the wrong one. We'll bring our shoes in here. There we go. OK. So now that we have our three-point lighting set up, we can use this as a foundation to change and, and art direct some really creative effects. So before we get on to the second look, I'm going to show you guys a really fun way to save this as your, as your default scene. And what that allows is that anytime you open a new Cinema 4D scene, you'll have this three-point lighting setup ready to go. Because I think we're probably, what, 15, 20 minutes already in here. And you know some of this takes time to set up. <clears throat> So to do that, you would go into Window, Customization, and click Save as Default Scene. I'm not going to do that because I don't want everybody to start with the scene because that would be kind of obnoxious. But um, it's a really useful workflow tip, and I highly recommend it to anyone that's in product lighting or, or works with products. Cool. Um, so to go back to our definition of good lighting, you know, here we've created a lot of contrast. We're bringing a lot of focus to this Nike logo. We've created a lot of depth between our subject and our background. And we have this really interesting lighting setup that emphasizes different aspects of the shoe, between the stitching, the fabric, the heel. All of these shadows really amount to building this beautiful scene. And then the last thing we can do is play around with our camera a little bit, just to create a little bit of depth of field. So if we click our RS camera, which is our camera, and then we go to optical, under the optical tab, we have a few different attributes, much like a real life camera would. And we can toggle the bokeh. There's lots of different ways to say that. Um, and we can change the aperture size. And this is going to affect how much light is being let in. So you can imagine if we lowered this to like something like 0.1, everything's blurry. 
And let's say this is for a Nike shoot, so we want a lot of motion. We can add a little motion blur. Obviously, this is probably overkill, but maybe we increase the aperture to something like 0.8, or like 0.5. And now we have a little bit of depth of field going on, which helps bring more focus to this, uh, this shoe in the front. <clears throat> cool. All right, so that's look one. I think the only other thing here is that we're going to add a little bit of color into the background light. And we're going to do that by going into color. And maybe we bring in a little bit of a beige color here. Let's go right here. And now we're getting a really compelling ad that you, know, you might see on the Nike Instagram. Cool. All right, so let's get into, into look number two. One sec. <clears throat> So for look number two, a lot of the focus is going to be on how do we adjust the spread of our lights to focus on certain attributes. So let's just disable all of our lights again. And maybe we keep our, our backlight, let's keep our key on. And then we're going to lower our spread to something like 0.1. And we're going to get these really nice harsh shadows. I mean, that doesn't look, that doesn't look nice. Let's drop this to like negative five. <clears throat> negative six. And then we're going to reduce the overall size of our light. And the reason why is that when we drop the spread, the intensity of our light is so much stronger. So now that we have our key light, we can move this around. And maybe we drop our spread to negative 0.01 and our size to like something like 30. And now we're going to get this really mysterious looking lighting effect. Sorry. Negative nine. Um, so now that we have this kind of like barn door, I think in the production world this is called barn door lighting. You know, we want to create this almost like you're looking at it through the slit of a door, right? We're, we're going for this kind of Balenciaga, Louis Vuitton look. So before we get into that, you're going to notice that our textures aren't really looking Louis Vuitton. And what's so nice about Cinema 4D is that because our materials are node-based, we can make adjustments to affect the color of our shoe, right? We don't need to export these textures and manually color them. So what we can do is go into each of our textures here. I'm actually just going to disable the background shoe. Um, let's go into our node base editor. And this is the texture for the base of the shoe. So I have four textures for the shoe. We have the base, we have the Nike logo, we've got the laces, and we're going to use the node base editor to color each of these. So there's something called the color correct node. And when we bring that in, we can channel this through our, our main texture through the color correct node. And for those that are in photography, they see gamma, contrast, hue shift. These are all things that are very familiar. And we can change the hue and change the color of our shoe, which is fantastic. So I think for the Nike logo, we're going to go for a bit of a leather look maybe something like 30, and then we drop the gamma to like 0.4. So now we got some le leather on that, uh, on that Nike logo. And then let's go into some of our other textures and color those really quick. <clears throat> cool. So now we're looking at our, our base of the shoe. And I'm just going to plug that through a color correct note again. We're going to do a little hue shift. Let's go to like just play around with it. Let's just see what we get. So we, now we've got a lime green, a pink, a blue. You know, this gets really fun if we're trying to create different colorways for an ad or commercial. So let's stick to our beige. And because this texture includes a bunch of different colors, it's really hard. We don't have control over each individual color. So we can apply something called a color layer. And when we add in our color layer, this gives us another node that then we can use to try the exact color of our texture. So now it's black. And on the right-hand side here, you see color black. So let's add in maybe like a little bit of a beige. And maybe that's a little harsh. Let's just adjust the blend mode. Just play around with some of these. Maybe a, a multiply. Maybe we could do an average. We're trying to create that kind of like beige, Louis Vuitton look. Let's just go in this direction. Cool. Great. So we have a couple textures added now. Let's go into our, we've got two more to go through. We've got our, our laces. You can see those at the top. 
And then let's just add another color correct. We're going to plug our, our main texture into our input, and then our out color into our base color. And then we're going to increase the hue to something like, hey, we do. Let's go for another brown. Let's just increase that. Let's go for, yeah, I think that looks pretty good. Maybe drop the gamma just a wee bit. Cool. Love that. And now for our last texture here, this is our, our tongue, I believe. We're just going to add in another color correct node, add that to our input, and our output. And then let's do another hue shift. Something like 30, we want to get rid of that. I think it's like a little bit of green in there. Cool. Cool. So let's call these our, our Louis Vuitton collab. Now let's add in a couple of different, or let's add back in our backlight and our key. And let's do it in a way that's intentional, right? We don't want to just overexpose our shoe. We want to maintain this really esoteric, mysterious vibe. So we're going to lower the exposure of each of these just a little bit. And the only thing that we want to do is really highlight some of the edges of our silhouette here. So we're going to do that on the toe a little bit. And we don't want this wrapping around our shoe, so we're going to go lower our spread, which is going to focus our light. And then we're also going to drop the exposure and maybe move this around. And to show you what this is doing, I can solo our lights again. And as I'm moving this, you can see this is focusing on just the laces. So I'm actually going to lower our spread even more to negative 0.01, and we should be good now. So let's bring in our other lights again and our background. And maybe we can drop the exposure again and bring in our, back, our fill light. And let's move our fill light somewhere here. And now we can start to see that this actually is a shoe. So here we have our Louis Vuitton look. I think the only thing we were missing is a podium, just like you would see this you know, at a, at a museum or maybe on display in a really expensive store. Oops. Um, let's move our podium down. Um, we're going to just disable our blur just for now so we can see what that looks like. And let's increase our cue. Cool. It's maybe a little bit too big. Oops. Adjusting this in the wrong window. Oh, and, and for those that aren't aware, each of these four different quadrants are a different perspective on our scene. So the top left is our kind of like the camera view that we're looking at. The top right is our top view. And then the bottom two are our right and front view. And what's nice is that you have three different or four different planes to really modify your scene. So now I'm going to change the overall size to something like 150 by 150. Uh, maybe not our Y. Let's do 200 and then 150. And then let's add our little podium back up here. And now we have a really compelling look. Cool. And one of the things that we're also seeing here is that we have this kind of like un unintentional gobo. And what a gobo is, is that lighting effect that when light comes through a window, you have that kind of shadow that's cast from uh, the cross section of the window. So now we're getting that, that really nice kind of focused look. So now that we have our second look, we're going to get into our experimental look. This is where things are going to get a little crazy, so hold on to your seats. Thank you guys for sticking with me, because I know it's the end of the day. I know it's probably want to go home and chill out at the hotel. So let's get crazy. Let's just disable our cube. <clears throat> We're going to bring in, um, let's move our key light back. Let's just reset here to our three light setup. It'll be a good exercise to kind of go through everything again. Let's just bring this to like 600. Cool. Exposure to negative five. We're going to do a quick little reset. Just going to move everything around back to where we started. This is a little too big, 400, 200, boom. And then we're going to increase the exposure again to like negative four. And our backlight, negative seven, cool. And our fill light to like negative four. Cool. So now that we're back at our three-point lighting setup, we're going to bring in some new materials. And we're going to get a little crazy. So in order to bring in new materials into Cinema 4D, we have this Materials tab under Redshift. And we can just click Material. Pretty straightforward. And let's apply these to each of our different 
attributes or parts of the shoe. And now we're getting a really different look here, right? We're losing all of the textures, but now we can play with different materials and see how lighting affects them, right? Because we could play with something like glass. Now we got a glass shoe. Look how quick that is. It's insane. Then we can go to something like water. Maybe we can play with something like copper. And you can imagine the use cases for this, right? You know, if you're going for a very specific look or a very creative look, you know, we can adjust these materials and bring in some, some different creative approaches. So for this third look, we're going to focus on how roughness and how materials affect the overall look of our scene. And before we do that, I'm just going to set this to, let's go for a little glass here. And this is going to give us a nice kind of starting point to build our scene. And we're going to change our background light to something a little more intense, like red. Ooh, spooky. And let's add another, let's add another element to our scene that I think will add a lot of interest. Let's just add a little, let's just add a little ocean under our shoe. I'm going to increase the background exposure here just so we can see what we're doing. And we're going to move our background back just a little bit. Oops. Um, background, let's move this back, cool. Cool, all right, so now that we have this plane, we're gonna use this to create a little bit of an ocean or a little bit of some water underneath our shoe. Um, not 100, 1,000. <laughs> My background's getting clipped here, one sec. There we go. My background light, let me just, Move this back a little bit more in our background light, just a little bit more. Cool. All right. <clears throat> so let's add a little bit of, of waves here. So we can go into our plane. Let's add a new material. Let's add a standard material. Let's apply that to our plane. And we're going to come in here and add something called a bump map. And what a bump map does is that it distorts our plane. And it's actually not affecting the geometry, but it's telling Redshift, which is our render engine, how to render uh, the vertices without affecting the geometry, which is why it's so much more efficient. Because for those that aren't familiar, there's two kinds of ways of distorting something, right? We can, we can move the vertices of the geometry, or we could tell Redshift, hey, render it this way. So the bump map is a bit more efficient, and we can add something like a max on noise into our bump map, Shout out Maxon, and plug that into our geometry. Um, let's go overall. Um, wait, one sec. Um, general, advanced, overall, bump input. That's what we're looking for. All right, and let's bring in another light so we can see this a bit better. So you can see we've got these kind of ripples, like they're almost like sand at the bottom. Um, and then maybe let's increase our background light just a bit, just so we can see the sand. Um, sorry, a negative two is probably gonna be better. Cool, so we're gonna adjust this noise. And what a noise does is that it is a, a 2D representation of, of randomness, right? And we can use different noises to affect different textures. So if I come into our material for our sand here, we can go into our noise. We go into our noise here. <clears throat> and under type, we have all these different types. So let's use something like wavy turbulence. This is going to give us that kind of like wavy effect. And let's increase the size. Um, let's go something like five for our scale. And now we're getting this almost like rock-like gravel, right? But we're still trying to create this wave effect. So to do that, we're going to stretch our rocks to something like 10, and now we're getting ripples, right? And you can see how powerful that is. And it's completely procedural, right? We're not loading any textures. It's purely just um, a mathem mathematical representation of randomness that we can just apply to our textures. So our water is looking a little choppy. Let's just decrease that a little bit. And maybe we lower our octaves. And our octaves are the, the measure for how complex our, our noise is. So maybe we do something like two. And now we're getting this really smooth water. Look at that. Cool. So we did that all in a matter of just a few minutes here. So now that we have our water set up, 
um, we can explore different materials with our shoe and how lighting and roughness affects our overall look. So let's come into our, let's go into our shoe, let's go into our glass, and then let's apply, let's just play with the glass. So within our glass, we have a whole bunch of different attributes. And the one that we're gonna play around with is roughness. And it's, re it's the reflection roughness. And that changes the way that the light is hitting or the way that light is reflecting off of our glass. So if we wanted to create a frosted look, we could do something and increase the roughness, something like 0.5. And then we also have something called IOR, which is the index of refraction. And the IOR, much like if you put a pencil in water and you can see it kind of uh, distort at a certain angle, that is IOR. So we can, we can adjust how lighting gets bounced around inside of our object. So if I go to something like 1.1, we're not really getting a lot of uh, distortion in the way that light is bouncing inside our object. But if we go to 1.8, now we're getting this really frosted look. And then what we're going to do now is bring in some color into our fill and backlight, and that's going to create a really unique look. So let's go to something like negative 3. And that should blend really nicely with our, our subject here. Cool. Maybe we can bring in, let's bring in some different colors. You can see how that's really channeling. Maybe we go for like a, go for like a little light blue or, cool. Maybe we can go even pink. Let's go, let's go for this kind of light blue. Cool. So you can already see where we're using our materials to adjust the way that light is being a, applied to our object. <clears throat> and then another thing that we can do is if we go back into our, our attributes here, um, we can play with something called dispersion. And dispersion is one of my favorite attributes to play with. And it creates this really cool iridescent, iridescent effect. So we're going to actually create another material. And we're going to apply this to, I'm just going to do this one more time. Cool. So we have a new material right here. And we're going to apply the, the glass preset once more. And this time, we're going to open up, I believe it's the Refraction Transmission tab. And there's this one little hidden attribute, which is so fun to play with. This is those like really trippy looking renders. This is what they use. So we're going to, I think to, to kind of further show this, I'm going to disable our background. <clears throat> and let's see if this renders here. Um, maybe we can bring in a little more light. Um, let's go back to our background light. Let's bring in a little more white. And now we've got this really cool kind of rainbow effect. It's a lot of fun to play with. So definitely check out Dispersion. Um, it's super, super cool. And then for our final kind of trick here, we're going to go into some post effects. And this is where we really maximize the most out of our renders. And people that are familiar with uh, color controls and the S-curve, um, this is where we can apply the S-curve. And that brings a lot of, it gives us a, a way to adjust the highlights and shadows and how they're distributed within our scene. So let's, let's go into the color controls here. We're going to create three different points. And on our highlights, we're just going to increase the highlights a little bit. And then in our shadows, I'm just going to decrease that a little bit. And this is going to bring a lot more focus to our subject, right? And we're doing that all with just an S-curve. So if I go a little before and after, you can see how we're bringing so much more focus to the subject of our scene. Cool. <clears throat> and then I think we can also play with the bloom. And the bloom is another effect. This is what creates that kind of glowing effect uh, that you see sometimes in renders. Um, if we lower the threshold here, you can see we get it's very sensitive um, and works more with scenes that have kind of colored lighting. Um, but maybe we lower the softness. We can increase the softness. You can kind of play around with it. But it's a very fun effect to play with. And then we also have flare. Let's see if we can bring a little flare out here. What flare does is it captures the reflections on the surface and gives you uh, some parameters to play with and adjust how um, those reflections add that kind of streaky effect. So we have flare, and then we also have streak, of course. Streak is similar to flare. Um, let's just apply some streak. 
So you can see in our post effects, we've got a lot to play with in terms of creating these cool renders. Cool. Awesome. We're just on time here. So that is actually all that I have. I hope this was insightful. I hope you guys have a better approach to lighting. And I hope that the three-point lighting setup is something that you apply to your renders. I highly recommend it. And it gives you a lot of control. And uh, yeah, if you want to check me out, I am on Instagram, uh, Jared with two R's. Uh, let's see if I can bring it up here. Do, 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 do. Actually don't have it on the slide because I forgot. But um, yeah, I basically post tutorials like this. Check it out. Thank you guys for coming. I hope, uh, I hope it was helpful.